Hey, what's happening? And welcome again to Discovery Church. We are at the midway, halfway point here in our series that we've called Legends. And all of last month, we studied the women. I'm excited. I was really excited to teach that. I am equally, I'll say equally as excited to get into the men this month. Come on, man. How many of you like the ladies' uh, study that we did, all the women of the Bible? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm really stoked to j- dive into these men uh, and to look at these legends that, that just went before us. And I was thinking about this. You know, there's like a very lucrative practice. It's, a, it's not a good one, uh, it, it's, it, but, but there is like mediums and tarot card readings, and, and they, they, they try to get you in contact with dead people, and you talk to them or they talk to you. I want to let you know something. Like, the, the dead can't talk to you, okay? And you can't talk to the dead. Whenever that happens, like when that does happen, that, that's actually a demonic spirit that you're in contact with, uh, so you just need to be aware of that. So there's no contact, but, but we're told in the scriptures that the, the, those legends that are in heaven right now, and, and they're celebrating their, their eternity, that they can actually see us running our race. And so in a lot of ways, like these, these legends can speak to us, not directly, but they can speak to us from their life story. Like their story can speak to us today, that the way they lived their life, the way they believed God, the way that they trusted him and they walked by faith and the great things that they were able to do, that speaks to us today. But not only that, not only in, the, in like the great stuff. I love this about the Bible. The Bible doesn't exclude the bad stuff, right? The, the Bible is full of people who, even legends that did great things and walked by faith, but they also messed up too. And, and so, so I believe that these, these legends, wouldn't, they, 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 if they could talk to us in this series, we're kind of taking some liberty here and saying, you know what, not only are they cheering us on, but what if they could actually speak to us from their life message and story and encourage us? What would they say? I believe that a lot of them would say, hey, run like I ran, you know, believe like I believed. But I think as well, a lot of them would also say, don't do what I did. (laughs) You know what I'm talking about? Like, don't do, you don't have to make the same mistakes. And that's why the stories are in the Bible there. That's why it's recorded. So you and I can learn their lessons and not repeat the same mistake. So let's go to the theme verse, and then I'll tell you who we're studying today if you haven't already peeked ahead. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, and that's what we're talking about there, these people that are in heaven right now witnessing our life, they're encouraging us, and because they're encouraging us and witnessing us run our race, let's throw off everything that hinders and the sin that's entangling us as we're going, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. So just like before in this entire series, if you miss any of them, you catch them online. We're going to take one character from the hall of heaven and and have them just come down from the Bible and and just kind of encourage us from their life story and life message. Today, the first guy we're going to hear from is Jacob. Jacob, um, there's more in Jacob's story in the Bible in Genesis, uh, you know, like 27 to 38, you know, somewhere around there. It, 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 there's, there's more in Jacob's story than almost any other character in the Bible. So this could be an eight-week eight week series by itself with Jacob. Um, but Jacob, Jacob struggled with what I believe every single one of us struggle with today. Like every one of us struggle with the same struggle that Jacob struggled with, and that is this struggle of control. Like we want to control our own life. We want to live life on our terms. We want to not only write our life, but we want to direct, produce, and star in our own story, okay? We just, we want to live life on our terms, and that was Jacob. Jacob constantly taking control of situations, and here's what I think Jacob would say to kind of capture his message. If he had just a moment with us to encourage us, he'd say, hey, when your life isn't turning out the way you hoped, because oftentimes that'll happen where it doesn't look right, and it didn't for Jacob a lot of times, like it didn't look like It was working the way he wanted to work. And in that moment, Jacob manipulated people. Jacob lied and deceived and tried to get his way through manipulation. From from birth, from from go, before go, Jacob was manipulating his way through life. We're told in the womb, in his mother, Rebecca's womb, one of the women we studied, um, he he has a brother, a twin, Esau. And the Bible says that as Esau began to breach the, the, the head nurse, you know, just wrapped a little cord around saying, okay, this was the first one. And Jacob wasn't having that. The Bible says Jacob grabbed the heel of Esau and said, I don't think so, buddy. Me first, you know, and, and just, and, and so that Jacob from the beginning was 
manipulating life. Later in life with that same brother, he would deceive him and trick him to selling him his birthright at one of his weakest moments. And, and um, all for is just a bowl of soup, which is a whole different message. But this, this created some animosity between that relationship. When Jacob found a woman, fell in love with her, that whole situation with his father-in-law, Laban, he manipulated his way through that. It was just messy and ugly. It was just, it was just a mess, you guys. And he, Jacob, what you need to know about Jacob is, is what's interesting is that Jacob, on multiple occasions, God tried to reach him. He tried to reach him. And so Jacob, throughout his life, had little mini encounters. So they were, they were good. You know, but they weren't great. They 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 kind of they weren't they weren't like a deep work. It didn't get everything worked out in his life, but some like it was. So they were okay encounters, but not great encounters because Jacob, after God trying to reach him, he still wanted to control his own life. He still wanted to work out his own life on his own terms. And so Jacob, I believe, looking in hindsight now because it's 2020, he'd say, "Hey, when your life isn't turning out the way you hope, here's a feeling: let God have control of your life." Just make sure you're not in control, okay? Just leave. let God do it. Let God have control. And before you think this is a simplistic message for you, can I tell you that every, even Christians, I will say this, most Christians struggle with this, with giving God the control of everything. So a lot of people, listen, a lot of people, they go to church. A lot of people call themselves a Christian, but God is really not the control of everything in their life. Because I don't have enough confidence in you, God, to trust you with my future, like my, my future. And I, I don't really trust you enough to control my career choice. I'm not going to let you pick my career choice. And I, don't, I sure don't trust you enough to control my money. I'm not going to have you control my money, God. And I'm not going to involve you in my relationships. I think I'll just take care of that one, God. And, 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 and we're really, I like, I like the fire insurance side of faith, God. I like that. But I don't know if I want you in control of everything. Because really, and here it is, really honestly, the reason why we do that is because I don't think that it will work out the way I want. I don't think, with me not in control, I don't think I'll get what, what I want. I don't think it'll be, it'll be pleasing or work out well for me. And at the heart of it, I just don't trust you, God. So I'll take it from here. And so if you find yourself ever in that place, or today you find yourself living in that place, you need to you need to learn something. Listen, that lifestyle of living in control, controlling people, controlling situations will always lead you to crisis. You will come upon crisis in your life. And are you ready for this? You may not like this about God, but it's true. God will allow the crisis in your life. He doesn't cause it, but he'll allow it because he's trying to get your attention. And some of us are going through a school of testing because our stubborn hearts and God is trying to get our attention we just won't let him have control of our lives. In fact, I read a quote. Mother Teresa said, you will never know God is all you need until he is all you have. And for a lot of us, we let it get to this point where he's all we have. It's like, oh, I got no other option now. I'm at rock bottom. Now I got to turn this way. Can I tell you something? You don't have to let it get there. You don't let it, have to let it get to this place. That's why these stories are in the Bible. That's why these legends have gone before us, witnessing our race, encouraging us now so that we don't make the same mistakes. When life isn't turning out the way you thought it, it should turn out, the way you hoped it would turn out, let God have control of your life. And when you do that, when you let God have control in your, of your life, three things happen. And I didn't come up with these three things. These are coming from Jacob's life. I just kind of just wrote out the text uh, of the scriptures I'm going to share with you guys and gave you guys some, some principles to it. But three things happened. The Bible says that, God, that Jacob finally had an encounter with God and gave him, gave him control. And it happened at a place, the Bible says he met God face to face at a place called Peniel or, or Peniel. And, and there he met God. And there he, he, the encounter got deep enough where he just said, okay, I'm all yours. And if you ever let God get, get to you enough for you to just release the control of everything, Three things are going to happen, and, and, and you need these things to happen, whether you know it or not today. You need these in your life. Here, write these down with me. Take some notes, you guys. Here's number one. When you, when you give God control, number one, you'll get a new strength. You'll get a new strength. So in other words, it's not you supporting you anymore. It's not you, your own energy, your own efforts. It's not your own manufacture. Let me say it this way. So you don't have to, you don't have to build your resume. You don't have to 
build your reputation. You don't have to uh, uh, worry about your image because you're going to find out one way or the other. Your strength is not enough. Your strength will run out. Your energy will run out. You need a new strength that is not your own. So here's the story in Genesis 32. It's actually the climax of Jacob's life at this point in Genesis 32. It says, this left Jacob all alone in the camp. And just to kind of catch up to speed here, what Jacob did is he separated his household, his family, and all of his goods in two, in two groups because he was going home and Esau was coming out to him to meet him with an army of people. And he was afraid, Esau don't like me. I stole his birthright. He, he's thinking, he's going to kill me. So I'm going to separate my family and my goods in two camps just in case if Esau kills, you know, off, he's not going to take everything from me. He ain't going to take all my stuff. So I'm going to separate it into two piles is what he's thinking. And it says, a man came. Now pause right there because I want you to recognize this word man. The Bible says that Jacob um, met God face to face. And this word man, this word is, is what, the, what theologians call theophany. It's when God comes in the form of a man, or even the pre-incarnate Jesus came in the, in the form in the Old Testament as an angel of the Lord or as a man or an angel. So this man that came to Jacob right there when he was left all alone in the camp was actually the angel of the Lord or Jesus in, incarnate or, or God. And I want you to recognize that, that God, that the angel of the Lord, came and wrestled with him. And for some of you, that's your every Sunday experience right there. You wrestling with God. You hear the word and you're like, oh, oh no, I don't, I don't think so. And that's like your whole life. You've been wrestling with a wrestling match with God. It says he wrestled with him until the dawn began to break. And the man saw that he would not win the match. So he touched Jacob's hip and wrenched it out of socket. So God was trying to let him know, oh, you think you're strong, Jacob? I'll show you how strong you are. Pop. It was just a touch. Just that's it. And, and, and you, need to, you, kinda, you need to see this, you guys, that um, God, this is how God operates. That God is giving you an invitation today. The same invitation he gave to Jacob. Here it is. Let go. Give in to me. Stop fighting against me. Stop wrestling me. I am, I'm for you. And some of you are so self-reliant, it's wearing you out. Some of you came into church today and you are so exhausted because you're living life by your own strength. And doing that, living life by your own strength, trying to control everything, trying to control your future, your destiny, control the people around you, control the outcomes is so exhausting. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. Isn't that so tiresome to live that life of trying to control everything? Jesus said it this way in Matthew 11. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. Anyone who's carrying the burden by yourself, you know you're tired today. He says, come to me and I will give you rest. Rest. Now, if you don't, if you didn't know the rest of this verse, you would think something different comes after it because what, what would you think would come after Jesus saying something like this? Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. I mean, you're carrying the loads around. Come to me and I'll give you rest. You would think the next line is, and lay down, right? <laughs> Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened and take a nap, all right? Relax. Kick your feet up. Jesus doesn't say that. He actually says the exact opposite. He said, come to me and I'll give you rest and get back to work. But get back to work a different way is what he says. You're going to have to work a different way than the way that you're working. You're going to have to work in a new strength. Take my yoke upon you. My yoke. Because the yoke you're, you're using right now, it, it's, not, it's not the right one. I studied this word yoke. And, and there's two different types of yoke and two different words that is used in this time for a yoke. And so the first, like generally a yoke, some of you guys know, a yoke is this big wooden piece with two holes cut out that they would put on oxen's heads and it was used for farmers. They would put two oxen together or cattle and they would plow a field and that would keep them in a straight line and doing it, doing those lines together. Well, the, the first type of yoke in, this, in these times were, were, it's the yoke that is a, your garden variety Walmart brand type of yoke, the one size fits all kind of yoke. So it's just like, it doesn't matter, throw it on. It's just the problem with those is after the, the day of plowing, the whole day you're plowing, this ox is plowing, you're plowing, you're plowing. At the end of the day, you're bruised and bloodied and, and, and just beat up by the work. That's not the word Jesus used, though. Listen, Jesus used the word for yoke that is the well-managed, custom-fit yoke. 
So some farmers that love their animals or had enough money, and Jesus being a carpenter, he probably would have built a few of these in his life. The carpenter would go out to the oxen and measure chest and shoulders and neck, and he would go and create a custom design yoke, and it would fit perfectly over the ox. So at the end of the day, at the end of the plowing, the, the ox is not beat up by the work. It didn't make him weary. Let, let me tell you, this is how it applies. Some of you, you're, you're plowing, you're working, but you're weary and burdened because the, the yoke you have is not the yoke God designed for you. There is, there is a work that God has designed for you, that custom fit, that you can be plowing and working and doing the will of God and living life. And at the end of it, your work doesn't make you weary. Your work doesn't leave you wounded. Your work doesn't leave you burdened. It's custom designed for you. That's what Jesus is saying. Look, hey, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden and burdened, and I'll give you rest. And, and this, is, this is what I need you to do now. Just continue working, but work a different way. Work, work with my design. You need a new strength. Some of you, that's, that's what, and I, he says, I'll give you rest. All throughout the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, there's this marker that, that identifies those who have the presence of God in their life. You know what that is? Rest. Is that the people that, that enjoy God's presence are people of rest. And I'm not talking about, rest is not the state of inactivity, okay? I'm talking about the position of your soul. It is this, it's this peace, it's this constance, it's this state of rest that we have. That's why you get scriptures in the Bible that says that those who, who put their hope in the Lord will renew their strength and will mount up on wings like what? Like eagles. Have you ever seen an eagle fly? They're majestic, aren't they? They just, they just glide, right? So they're flying, but they're not working. I mean, they're working, they're doing the work, but it's not wearing them out, is it? So you get eagles, they perch up really high on, on, on a nest. What happens, eagles actually wait to, to flop out of that nest for, for a heat from the earth, a current of heat to, to rise up from the earth. And they sense that and they ride that. So when they, when they jump out of that perch, you see, you, you ever seen an eagle before? It's just one flap, right? Boom, and they go. Why? Why? Because they're, they're not relying on their own strength. They're relying on an energy that's, that's upholding them and sustaining them in flight. Okay, I don't know. I don't know about you, but every time I see an eagle, I get all patriotic and stuff. I'm like, <laughs> my country tis of thee. I start. It's just beautiful the the majestic nature of the eagle, and that's what that's what that's what the Bible says that you'll look like when you when you put your hope when you put the control of your life into God's hands. You you uh, compare that to like your guard. You're just birds, right? Just regular old small small birds. In my backyard, we have a lot of birds. There's so many species of birds. It's really cool to watch them. We have some that are actually nesting in our backyard. And I think I'm, I, I'm going to go get these feeders and stuff because I love just watching the birds. And I hope that I didn't lose respect from any of you guys right now by saying that. But, <laughs> but it's fun. It's, but, I, but I watch these birds. And these birds, these tiny birds, they're just, they, they flap their wings so fast. They're not, the eagles just, whew. these little birds are like, and then they rest on a perch. And they just keep going. And some of you, that's what your life looks like. Your life does not look like the eagle. It looks like the bird. Some of you are like, Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. Sunday, Sunday. You know that's what your life looks like. Come on, somebody. And what you need, what you need is a new strength. And, 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 are, and are, you, are you going to, here's the question, are you going to rely on your own power, your own flapping, or are you going to rely on the power of the Holy Spirit that lifts you up and sustains you in flight, in work? And, and, and the only way to get there is to give the control, to release the control to Jesus, to give him control of everything. Here's the second thing that's going to happen when you give the control to God, and that is you get a new identity. You get a new identity. And this statement is, is partly true because you really don't get like a new identity. You actually, when you, when you give the control of your life to God, you just get the identity that was already designed. When you give your life to God and the control, you just get the original plan. It's not like God's like, okay, finally you came to me. I can start writing your plan out. No, God already has it. 
He has your identity, your plan. It's what you're doing when you give him control is you say, okay, I want the original design instead of the design that I'm manufacturing, God. You get a new identity. That's why the next thing the angel said to him was, in verse 27, he asked Jacob, what's your name? See, the angel knew his name, but here's what, what he wanted him to come face to face with the identity that he created for himself. And God will have you do that. God will have you face what the, the identity that you've assumed and the life that the control that you're trying to have. And he replied, Jacob, which Jacob literally means deceiver. Manipul so, so, you know, what's your name? Uh, deceiver. What's your name? Uh, control freak. What's your name? Oh, alcoholic. What's your name? Uh, divorcee. What's your name? Uh, unlovable. What's your name? God will have you come face to face with whatever name and identity that you have assumed that is not. And what does he say next? Look, he says, look at that. Your name will no longer be Jacob. I didn't create that. I didn't call you that. That's not, that's not who you are. From now on, you'll be called prince with God. That's what Israel means. See, I know you don't see yourself as a prince of God. I know you see yourself as your past and your wounds and your history. I know that's how you, but if you'll let me, if you give me the control of your life, I can make you into a prince, God says. I can make you into a prince because you fought with God and with man and you've won. And I need you to hear that today. You need to know this about your God, that your God does not see you for your past, for your mistakes, for all your hangups. Your, your God sees you not for what you did, uh, he sees you for your, for your possibilities, though. He doesn't see your, your old identity. He sees the one he's already written, your new identity, not the one you created for yourself. And every time, all throughout the Bible, when God encounters somebody, he, he will have them face their old identity, and, and then he'll like, re, often rename them, give them the, a name that fits what God sees inside of them. And all throughout the Bible, you see this. In one occasion in your notes in John 1, is a story where God renames Peter, and it says that Andrew brought to Jesus, him to Jesus and said, Jesus tells him, you are Simon. That's what they call you. That's what his mama called him. That's what everybody called him. He says, that just means someone who listens to God. That's what Simon means, someone who listens to God. So he was a listener of God, but Simon wasn't doing anything with his life. He wasn't, he wasn't a doer of the will and the word of God. He was just doing his own thing. He listened, but he wasn't a doer. And he said, oh. You will be called Cephas, which is translated Peter, which means rock. It, it, literally, in one statement, Jesus changes Simon Peter to, from listener to the rock of God that I'm going to build my church on and advance my kingdom. In one statement, in one encounter, I'm telling you, you need to let him have control of your life, and he'll give you a new script. He'll give you a new identity. Here's the third thing, and that is you'll get a new joy. And, you, and we need this so desperately in life, a new joy, because so many of us are surviving on a happiness, but not the... See, joy is, joy is internal, not external. Joy does not have anything to do with this earth, circumstances. Happiness comes from that. Ha happiness, the root word of happiness comes from hap, happenstance. It's circumstantial. So, so many of us, are, our happiness is up and down with how this world is treating us or how our boss is treating us, or what our finances are looking like, or what the economy is looking like, or what my relationships are looking like. And I'm either up or down or hot or cold or in or out based upon what's happening around me. And God is saying, look, if you just give me control, I'll give you a new joy, and nothing this earth has can touch you. It'll be internal. It'll be something that I put inside of you, not external based on circumstances. Now watch what happens. Jacob says, hey, angel, Please tell me your name. Here's Jacob still trying to control the situation. Hey, what's your name? Who are you? Who are you? What's going on? What's going on here, Jacob said. And basically, he says, there's not enough time for us to go over all this. I can't, I can't give you all the details of who I am. He just put them off. He goes, why do you want to know my name? Then he says, here's what you need. Hey, Jacob, you don't need to control this. You don't need to control life and control the situation. Jacob, you don't need more mental understanding of my name or who I am. What you need is a touch from me. You need a touch from God. And the Bible says he blesses them right there. 
And that word bless, a lot of people get that confused and misinterpret that. Some people think to be you know, blessed of God means you got a lot of money and a lot of things. That's not the word. That's not what it means, okay? I mean, you can have a lot of money and things, but that's not the word. Blessed has nothing to do with your circumstances or with your stuff. The, the Greek word there for blessed is makarios, and it, it literally means an internal joy. Internal joy, which is why in the Beatitudes, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus, he keeps repeating this, this phrase, bless, bless, I'll bless you, I'll bless you, I'll bless you, I'll bless you, you'll be blessed. How? Look at Matthew chapter 5, 6. Blessed, the internal joy, are for those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. For they are the ones who will, who will be fulfilled in this life. So what's the point? The point is, give the complete control fully to God. And listen, nothing this earth has can touch you. Because your, your, your uh, satisfaction does not come from this earth. Your fulfillment does not come from this earth. There is a joy, the Bible says, that is unspeakable and full of glory. So I, I, I imagine Jacob would, he would, now he's, he's going to leave us and there's going to be another person who's going to come and we're going to be encouraged by. But I think he would tell us a few little don't forgets before he goes. So let me close with some don't forgets from the life of Jacob, you guys. This is what I believe he would say. I believe he'd say, hey, don't forget, brokenness is what precedes breakthrough. Brokenness is what precedes breakthrough. See, with a lot of people that try to control people and control situations, you're trying to control your own advancement, promotion, and breakthrough. And God's saying it don't happen that way. It does not happen in my economy, in my kingdom. Brokenness is what precedes breakthrough. Now, a lot of people have the wrong understanding of God. They really do. They think God is someone who's judgmental, that demands perfection, that is constantly looking at their life and their sins. And when, they, when you step out of bounds and blowing the whistle on you, that's not God. That is not God. Listen, all God wants from you is honesty. It's for you to be honest about who you are, where you are, and your need, the condition of need that you are in. That's all he wants. He never intended the relationship that we have for him to be like, oh, God, hey, thanks, God, for another day. You know, it was great. Thanks. And, and, and you know that sin thing, God, I think I got it. I'm up to about 90%, I feel like, got that worked out of my life. God is not looking at that stuff. He's not looking at your sin life the way you think he's probably looking at your sin life, what he desires is this heart that is broken, that is undone. A heart that says this, I have to have you. God, I need you. I can't do it without you. I don't want to do it without you. I need you. I am undone, God. I don't want to go any further, not another step without you. That's why I love this verse, Psalm 51, 17. One of my favorite verses in the Bible. It says, the sacrifices of God are, aren't coming to church. You didn't sacrifice because you got up on Sunday and came to church. Oh, I saw you sac that's not a sacrifice. You are not sacrificing your morning because you got up and read a devotion. That's not the sacrifice of God. Look what it says. The sacrifices of God is a broken spirit. God, I need you. I'm, I'm undone. I can't do it without you. I'm incomplete. I'm not whole without you. Look at a broken and contrite heart. It says, oh God, you will not despise it. And not only will he not despise it, but the Bible says he's actually attracted to that spirit of brokenness, to a heart that says, I need you and I can't do it without you. Like he's drawn toward that heart that is crying out to him like that. First Peter, or, uh, First Peter chapter 5, verse 5 and 6 says this, that God opposes, I'm going to stop right there because whenever you, like, whenever you see that, that, that phrase, God opposes, you never want to find yourself on the other end of that sentence, okay? You don't want to ever find yourself on the other end of an opposition boxing match with God. You are going to lose 10 times out of 10. Now listen, if you are the type of person, or today you found yourself, even as God is convicting you, that you are still in control of your life or in different areas of your life, listen, you're going to find yourself on the opposing side of God. Because God opposes those who try to control their life. God opposes the proud. But look what he says. But he shows favor. Now, that's the word you want associated to your relationship with God. The favor of God to who? The humble. 
the humble. The next sentence he begins, he says, so humble yourself. Say that word out loud with me, guys. One, two, three. Humble. Say it one more time. One, two, three. Humble yourselves. All right. Look, God is, you're, you're either going to get humbled or humble yourself. Take the easier road. God is saying, look, I'll, if you tr- continue to try to control, I'm going to continue to put through the school of testing. You're going to get to that place where, where all you have to do is look up because you ain't got nothing else in your life. It, either I'm going to humble you or you can choose to just humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that, look, that he may lift you up in due time. So you don't lift yourself up. You don't, you don't advance yourself. You don't kick down the door. You don't manipulate that situation or person or deceive. And you don't try to hold on to it and get yourself there. God says, you try to do that, I'll, I'll, I'll humiliate you. I will cast you down. I will humble you. But if you just humble yourself, put yourself in a, in a, in a low position, I will lift you up to where I've called you. Come on, somebody. Am I preaching better than you're responding or what? You're going to be humbled. It's just, it's just better off you humble yourself. Just that brokenness. Some of you need that today. And all you need to do, all you need to do is just like, if I give you a mental picture, is just, it's just this, right? Just to like release the control. Okay, God, all right, it's yours. I'm not going to hold on to it anymore. I need you. All, here, here, all of me, God, you have it. Here's the second thing Jacob would say. I believe he'd say, you must lose yourself to find yourself. You must lose yourself to find yourself. Do me a favor. On that first yourself, circle that, that self part of yourself. The first yourself, circle the self part of there because I want you to see something here. Because you must lose your self. You must lose your sense of self. You must lose your current identity the, the life that you've controlled, the life that you're living to find your true self, the identity that God has for you. Let me say it this way. You must lose Jacob to find Israel. You must, you must lose what labels you're holding on to to find the label that God has put over you, the original label, the original design. Mark 8, 34, I love this message translation of it. Jesus says, uh, calling the crowd to join his disciples. I love that because this is what I believe we're doing today. Today, I'm uh, probably going to teach like around a a thousand or so people today. And today, this invitation is the same because truth be known, out of all those people that I'm teaching today, some of you are in the crowd. And here's the invitation that Jesus has given you. And if you're in the crowd, that's just, you're just showing up. You show up. You, you, but Jesus, but God's not really in control. He's not in control of everything. He's not in control of your life. Just show up. Maybe you just want the fire insurance. I don't know, but you're in the crowd. And the invitation to you is a deeper walk with Jesus. Jesus called the crowd, come, be my disciple. Take a step closer to me. How do you be a disciple? How do you do that? I'm glad you guys asked. Here's how he said. But if anyone wants to be my disciple, they got to come to me and he has to let me lead. That you're not in the driver's seat anymore. I am. That if you try to hang on to your life, the life that you created, the identity that you created, that you think is yours, he says you'll lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake and for the sake of the good news, you will save it. That's what, you'll, you'll hear me repeat this, repeat this phrase over and over again, and it's, Go all in. Don't hold back. Like, give God control of everything in your life. In fact, I like to challenge people, give God a year of your life. Give Him one year. Some of you, this is a challenge that you need to take today. Give God one year of your life. Mark the calendar. Give Him control of everything and see what He can do with the control of your life rather than you. See, like, like, and then, and and when I say control, I mean do everything. Just, just say yes to God. So get into a small group. The small groups are launching. This is a great time for you to just start saying yes to God. All right, God, I'm just going to start. I'm going to start living life on your terms, not on my terms. I'm going to stop trying to write, produce, direct, and star my own show. And I'm just going to surrender to you, God, and live on your terms. So I'm going to get into a group. I'm going to build some healthy relationships. I'm going to cut away some bad relationships. I'm, I'm going to get into a, 
a, a team and serve. I'm going to go to the next step classes and figure out my identity and my calling. I'm just going to do, I'm going to get in the game, God. Do that for one year and see, see what God does with the control of your life. Here's the last one that, that I think this is something that you need to buy into in order to really do what Jacob is encouraging us to do, the life of Jacob is encouraging us to do, to just give God the control of everything, I really need you to buy into this last statement. And I believe that Jacob would, would try to, based on his life, get you to see the truth of this statement that really today in Jesus' name, something needs to shift in our minds and in our hearts today to believe something different, to give, really give God the control of our lives. And here it is, number three. That really being in control actually limits your life. Yeah, I get it. I know, I know you think you're advancing yourself. I know you think that with the control, you're in control, that you're enhancing and advancing and promoting. It's going the way you want it to go. You think it should go, but that is a lie. You need to buy into a different truth today if you're really going to give God the control. And here's the truth, that you being in control actually limits your life, it limits the destiny God has for you, the calling He has for you. It limits it. People who control, control things, they usually gravitate to like-minded people that are controlling. So Jacob, in Jacob's life, he, he, he found himself under a Laban who was a manipulator, a, a master manipulator. So you try to live your life manipulative and controlling, you're going to find yourself getting taken advantage of too one day, maybe even throughout your life. And then he falls in love with a, with a Rachel, and Rachel, remember, steals her father's goods and lies about it. Why? Because controlling people attract controlling people into their lives. And people who want to stay in control, they often, they often hurt people. And it's usually the people they love the most because they want to get their way. And you might even be a good, you might even, this is the way it should be. This is the way I want it to go. But because you want it so bad to control, you plow and mow over people to get it. This was Jacob. Jacob hurt his father. His father was crushed. He deceived him and manipulated his father to give him the, the blessing of the firstborn. His own brother, twin brother, wanted to kill him because of his trickster tendencies and manipulation with his brother. If you continue to be in control, I'm telling you, you're going to limit your life. You're going to end up hurting the people that are closest to you. And then worse yet, people who try to control their own life, they live far beneath the privileges of God. They live far beneath the calling and the destiny that God has for you. You see, Jacob, it was so clear that Jacob was already called by God, had a destiny and a purpose. He was going to be a leader and a person of significance. It's, it's just that Jacob didn't believe it. He didn't trust God with his future. Look what the Bible says in Genesis 25, 23. It says, the Lord said to Rebekah, his mom, that two nations are in your womb. Two people within you will be separated. One will be stronger than the other. Look at this. And the older Esau will serve Jacob, the younger. All that pain caused in his life, all that manipulation and control, all because he didn't trust God. Listen to this. He, he was trying to fight for a future that was always his. He was trying to manipulate an outcome that God had already shown favor on. Are you hearing me today, church? Like this... If you in control, you're living under the privileges of God. And I love this about God, that God is, God is able to, no matter, because Jacob lived his, most of his like, life, young life, as Jacob the deceiver. It wasn't until late in life that he became the prince of God, Israel, and allowed God to change him and transform him by giving him control. But even then, I love this about God, even then, God can cause your missteps, your past, your mistakes to still fit into the plan, the purpose, and the destiny he has for you. It did not thwart God's plan for Jacob at all. God's will was still established for him, and he was still a leader of significance. I'm reminded of the prodigal son as well. The prodigal son, like Jacob, um, had everything he wanted, but he didn't know it. He thought, if I was in control, shoot, if I had that money, 
I do what I want. I get my way. I get, so you guys know the story of the prodigal son. He goes to his dad and says, hey, give my inheritance, man, because I'm tired of living under your control. I want it. Give me my, give me my stuff. He gives it to him, and he goes out and squanders it. He gets broke. He finds himself broke, busted, and disgusted in a pig pen, all muddy, and, and he, just, he comes to, the Bible says he comes to his senses, and he says, man, life was not as good as I thought it would be with me in the driver's seat. <laughs> With me in control, I was, man, it was so much better when dad was in control in my father's house. And the Bible says he came to his senses and he just made his way. He said, I'll just go and be a servant in my dad's house. I'll just be a lowly servant. And his father sees him from afar off and runs to him, grabs him. And that's where we pick up in your notes in Luke chapter 15 up here on the screen. It says, the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. There's three things, three highlights that I have here. The things that he puts on him and gives him are significant. I'm going to tell you what they mean. He says, bring the best robe and put it on him and put a ring, a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet and bring the fattened calf, kill it. We're going to partake because my son was lost, but now he's found. Here's the three things that, that he gives him. And this is what happens. This is what God wants to give you when you give the control. When you come to your senses and give the control of everything back to God. Here's number one. The robe stands for the robe of righteousness. Everywhere in the Bible, that's what the robe signifies. Isaiah says that we are clothed, we are robed in righteousness. This is not a righteousness you create. This is not a righteousness you fabricate. This righteousness comes from God. The Bible says that 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 God causes from within you to obey and do His will, that there is a righteousness from God living inside of you, that we are clothed with this. It's not yours. It's ro- you're, you're given it. It's put on you. You're given a robe of righteousness. The second thing was the ring. That stands for the ring of authority. The ring in those days, was, was it, it showed who you belonged to. It was a family ring. There was usually a seal of the family or the name or the crest of the family. And, and anyone with a ring had the authority of the family and the name of that person. As I'm wearing this ring, so does so, so the name is behind it. You need to know something today. You, you are wearing the ring of Jesus Christ. Do you know that? That you, you have access to the most powerful authority in all the world. You need to start using it, church. He says, I'll give you the robe of righteousness, the ring of authority. And then he says, the shoes, that stands for the shoes of peace. He put shoes on his feet, which brought comfort again to him. In Ephesians chapter 6, we're told that, that part of the armor of God was our feet are fitted with the gospel of peace. One, one definition of peace in the Bible is an internal joy. An internal joy. See, when you give God the control of your life, you get these three things. Look at them with me, guys. You get a robe of righteousness. Listen, you get a new strength. One does, that does not come from you, not you supporting it. God puts a, a righteousness within you that causes right living. You don't have to try to be right and do right. No, man. When you give full control to God, the Spirit of God inside you, is you are robed with righteousness. You get a ring of authority, a new identity, a name, a seal that God has put on you. And you get the shoes of peace, a joy unspeakable and full of glory. When you give God, when you come to your senses and give God the control of your life. Here's the bottom line. Fill this in and then leave your notes right there in your lap. We're going to pray. Here's the bottom line. God takes complete responsibility for the life that is given completely to him. 